Hello, again. So I, I didn't have a uh, time to properly introduce Marina and Jürgen because we have also people here who may not know you that well because these two actually interrupted. Thank you. So uh, uh, Marina has been diplomat for as long as... 26 years. Oh, well, very good, 26 years, and was also one of the candidates of our last presidential election and now running for the your... The most popular one. Definitely. <laughs> That's very good. And now you're running to, for European Parliament, right? Uh, national Parliament and European Parliament. So you're going, going to both? Depends on the voters. All right. And Jürgen here <coughs> has, I think you have been part of Estonian Parliament since, what, 1995? This means also like forever? Yes. So <laughs> professional <laughs> parliamentarian. And I'm also the best diplomat in, in politics. <laughs> that we all know, that's why we have the beep beep here. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, also you have been three times or four times minister? Uh, more. More. <laughs> uh, okay. Four portfolios. All right. So this means that you are all also a professional minister. Very good. I think we can start. So first question will be uh, inspired by what we have heard today. And this is a very simple one. Quotas, no quotas. And I'll give a first <coughs> word to Gunmor. Well, actually, uh, I think I would agree in principle with uh, my fellow Finn Risto that just left. Uh, but I think actually uh, the discussion about quotas and the legislation about Norway and, and Iceland has helped tremendously. So I would like to extend a, a thank you to Iceland that is present for, for that. I think there's one third argument for why, uh, personally, I, I haven't liked quotas, and that's uh, it's not maybe always the nicest thing to be defined as a quota person being elected to a board. Uh, normally, you want to be elected for your personal capacities. So uh, th that's maybe the third <coughs> argument. But I can see that it pushes things. So that's why the threat of having uh, legislation on quotes and uh, the European Union is still discussing also this uh, alternative as, uh, as a European regulation. Uh, so I think it's uh, stimulating the national debate a lot in a positive way. Let's ask the same question from a liberal. Jürgen, do you think Estonia needs quotas in order to have more women in politics and in the boards of the companies? Certainly not. They are not helpful. I think uh, uh, thing, things tend to be normal in the world. And I think if we push uh, changes, uh, we cause uh, more, more uh, conflicts, more discrimination. And I can say that uh, there is positive uh, uh, discrimination in politics in many areas already in Estonia. Uh, and, and this is enough. For me, I think uh, I can say that uh, I am like a discriminated person. I'm a middle-aged man and I al always uh, know that, uh, that my chances are, are, let, uh, are, are smaller than, than uh, women of uh, the same qualification. Marina, do you want to comment Marina. on she, that? She's more popular than me. <laughs> Well that, was, than that was, well, that was an interesting conclusion, but coming to a question. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say first, it's really interesting mm. that even Finland is now discussing whether quotas or not. Mm. I, remember, I meant private I re companies only. But, but still, yeah. I remember some not five... Not political six, organizations. Let's say some five, six years mm. ago, it was quotas, quotas, quotas. Mm. But now there is discussion about it. Mm. Personally, I've seen both. I've seen countries where quotas have changed political life, political climate. For example, I've been talking to women parliamentarians from Rwanda, Rwanda, who mm. got into the parliament as women with the quota, and second time they were elected, mm. not within the quota, by the, but by themselves. What I also think, I think that you can't and you shouldn't impose something if society is not ready. And if I look at Estonian society, I'm sorry for the comparison, but we're like, anonymous alcoholics, <laughs> we have said that, yes, we have the problem. We have taken even some first steps. But at this point, I would argue, we are not <clears> ready <throat> to introduce the quotas, 
it's difficult to agree with Jurgen because on these topics I never agree with him, but I have to say that here he has a point. That if something is compulsory, something is imposed from above, and society is not ready, then it might be not so useful. But again, I, uh, my final remark is that there are different practices worldwide, and each and every society, each and every country has to find its own way. But what do you think? What's the Estonian way then? I think that we are, at the moment, we're having discussion. At the moment, I don't feel that there is so much, maybe, anonymity uh, or uh, not so many people against. But at the moment, I also feel that we have promoted other measures. Other measures, for example, being examples, role models. I come from foreign policy. UN has been discussing 50-50 for how many years? 50? When UN will have the first woman secretary general? Mm. When NATO is having the first woman secretary general? Mm. So I'm coming from politics. Let's, let, let's look at them. And let's look at uh, and the good examples. And another good example, I come from diplomacy. When I was ambassador to Moscow, there were 141 men and me. I would say that <laughs> American women changed the pattern. When three foreign secretaries, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Clinton showed the whole world that a woman can be a foreign minister of one of the biggest and greatest states in the world, it changed thinking. Mm. Now there are much more women in diplomacy as ambassadors. Now there are many more women foreign ministers. So it's not only imposing, but it's also promoting, role modeling, and supporting. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. Asmundur, do you think Iceland has enough role models? I think uh, we both need, we both need in Iceland, for my opinion, is that we should use quotas, as I said in my speech. But we need both quotas and role models and other, other tools as well. Because you can't, you can't only have quotas. You need to, you need to have more ways to, uh, to support this. But the thing I want to mention here, because we're talking about politics, is I mentioned earlier that we had discussion in the parliament where all the MPs came together to discuss gender equality for a whole day. And we discussed it, the men together uh, on the different parties, uh, and then women, and then we mixed it and discussed it again. And the discussions there were that in politics, which is, can often be, it's been like it's been a man world where you can, where it's allowed to put out the elbows. And for women, it's, they said, when we were discussing this uh, openly, that uh, this kind of politics were harder for women than for men. And that's what they felt. And we have seen in Iceland in politics that women tend to uh, be for shorter period in politics than men and maybe part of that is uh, part of that is uh, why we need the quotas why we need to have quotas because we want to have men and women and we have we have established that and i think that is through quotas or or some tools that you use to have it more equally 50-50 men and women representing each party each uh, area or so on but for Estonia, you will have to decide. Thank you. Can we just wake up tomorrow morning and see that, oh, the change has happened? Is it possible? You're change. in parliament. Do you think yeah. part members of Estonian parliament can initiate something to help this change? Role mm. models, perhaps? I have no idea. I really don't know. I don't think so. That's... OK, I'm going to change the topic. Yeah. Gunnar, did you want to add anything to this? Please. Uh, well, uh, I, I would say that uh, what I think, because what I think, first of all, when you look at the business life, at least in Finland and probably also the other Nordic countries, it has changed immensely uh, the gender uh, roles over the past 20 years. And one thing, except uh, I, I would admit that the, the legislation and, and the discussion on quotas have probably pushed things in the right direction in all countries, but also uh, the need for transparency that has come through the increased regulation uh, for especially listed companies, uh, where you have uh, much more uh, transparency on nomination processes, mm -hmm. on, on reporting, and um, also as we have now in Finland since 2016 that actually uh, you have to explain uh, why you don't have 
diversity in your organization or in your board. Mm -hmm. And you have also to put targets and you have to uh, describe what exact actions you have done. So this all increased transparency around uh, all nominations have also brought the question of diversity, which is much more than women. It's mm -hmm. also the need to have much more uh, non-Finns on the board, for example. It's uh, to have young and old people. It's to have different professions. And I think the whole discussion around increasing the number of women has also actually brought other kinds of diversity uh, to, to the leadership of this business life. So I think it's many things that have, have uh, pushed this uh, positive uh, development that we see doesn't mean that we doesn't have we, do we have a lot to do still definitely Marina yeah, wanted yeah. to comment yeah well it's a good to be with on the same panel with Jorgen he never speaks so we can have his time but what I wanted to say was when I was foreign minister and we were having interviews with uh, people who participated in the competitions the competitions were heavy 20 persons for one vacancy and I asked always one question What's, why are you joining the Foreign Service? What's your aim? Boys, without any hesitation, we want to become ministers, ambassadors. Girls took some time, they thought about it, and they started discussing, I love foreign culture, I've been to those countries, I want to contribute to my country as, an, I don't know, as a diplomat, whatever. So the level of ambitions was much, much lower. So what I want to say is that Kunur mentioned some of the methods, but mm. we should also encourage and mm. support Absolutely. those who want. So that if yes. somebody wants to join politics, we have to be very open and frank about it. It's not easy. I did it a year ago. They took me to pieces, put together, when I was on a visit with Timo Soini <laughs> to Australia and New Zealand, nobody paid attention to what Timo was wearing. <clears throat> but everybody was discussing my purse. So you have to get used to that. But if you want, then you have to know how does it really work and we'll support you. We'll support you, we'll be open, frank and supportive. So Jürgen, has anybody ever commented on your purse? Uh, yes, very often. <laughs> I'm always yes, incorrect in words and, and behavior and everywhere. But I, I thought, uh, listening to Marina, that uh, it means I am a woman because I had to spend 10 years in universities, three universities, and, and 10 years in the parliament uh, until I was invited. Oh, actually, uh, I didn't want to become a common minister. I, uh, my, my ambition has always been lower than the, what has happened. So. And you've been four yes. times minister, come on. Yeah, yes. No ambition, four times I minister. I have never asked uh, this uh, post. I have always been asked to, to come to the parliament. I, that's right. And so, uh, but, but it is in, in the ambition in politics uh, tends to be too high in most, most people. So um, I don't think it's, it's actually normal. But what, yeah. about, uh, what about education? Can we change something there so that when girls grow up, then uh, they already have the amb ambition, they have the self-confidence to take those challenges? Because I, I have experienced exactly the same. I, I also train a lot of uh, mm -hmm. female politicians and, and I see the difference. The ambition level really is different. Anything you've done in Iceland regarding yes. education? There's a big discussion about that now and discussions between the, uh, the education sector and the gender equalities uh, that we should start earlier because uh, we also see the, the trend that younger people, uh, they think differently than, than the next generation. So that's how it is, that we should start earlier by educating uh, about gender equality, about gender stereotypes and such on, because that's that, by doing that, then we, by, by starting there, then we will change more in the future. That's where the future lies. So uh, there's, a, there's a discussion about changing the educational system uh, to start more, uh, uh, teach more gender issues and so on. So I think that's a, that's a very positive thing. So Gunvor, Finland has one of the best education mm. systems in the world. Do you, anything well, to well, learn I from it? I would say uh, today I think you can almost say that women are better educated than men in Finland. And uh, especially when you look at young, younger generations, um, that's actually causing other kinds of challenges that society needs to, to deal with. 
But I think it's, it's not only about education, it's a lot about the courage and uh, the self-esteem. Uh, I used to, to tell uh, young people that you should, as a girl especially, uh, you should become a scout. It's very good to be a scout because you learn leadership in practice, actually. Looking at scout statistics, a very big number of scouts worldwide have become leaders. Uh, and also, uh, as a parent, you really need to challenge your daughters, I think, to mm -hmm. Uh, not to say, to take challenges, to say yes. Uh, and what I think the educational system can do is uh, to push uh, also girls to study more mathematics and natural sciences. I think that's where one of the divides uh, really is. Uh, it's not in, in, um, in medicine or, or many of the other professions. So there are things that can be done. And wh what I would say, the, the last thing, I can't stress enough is uh, the welfare state arrangement around daycare, uh, equal parenthood, all these things where society can help uh, young men and, and women actually have, have a, a decent career uh, on an equal basis. That's really important for you politicians to work on. Jürgen, comment? I, I do not use to be silent. Uh, Marina is not telling the truth, but I am trying to be silent on uh, toxic uh, uh, issues. But education is not so toxic. I can comment on it. Uh, uh, we all represent the best uh, education systems in the world, I think, at least best schools. Um, and uh, we have similarity, but, but uh, how it um, influences uh, gender equality, uh, first, that schools, uh, boys are always discriminated. It's uh, even discussion whether they could uh, <clears throat> start later to be, um, uh, to be better ready. Uh, always um, the girls are but better at school. And then the final uh, is also, as, as you said, uh, women are better educated by years. But where mm. it comes... Uh, part of, uh, of um, inequalities in, in salaries is, uh, is uh, the choice of uh, specialities. Mm. Uh, clever girls uh, still choose software, uh, software well, areas, area a lot. Areas. Areas, yes, and, mm. and uh, those are, tend to be less paid. So the, the ambition of boys maybe uh, is one, but what also, via education system, helps uh, uh, them still pass uh, women by in salaries. They tend to, uh, try to uh, choose uh, maybe often more boring, but but better paid uh, areas. In our next in, session, in, 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 in the West. In our next session, we are actually going to have a very interesting uh, research exactly mm. on the topic from, from Denmark, so uh, mm. we're going to have more insights. But um, let's talk a little bit of the topic and let's talk about money. So, uh, and money regarding the pay gap. In Estonia, it's close to 20%. Even in Finland, I was totally amazed when I read that it's 16. It's, it's, mm. it's rather high. And uh, all over Europe, I, I guess this is uh, a serious issue. Now, is it, is it a problem? Is it a real problem? Because uh, the research shows that in some cases, it's actually just also because there are jobs that are more riskier, uh, need more physical uh, power, and are therefore also uh, better paid. And so this is some part of it that breaks that gap. But there is also a huge gray area that we are not able to explain. So, you want to comment on that and how it actually stops uh, the uh, mm. development? I think there are many reasons for that. First of all, I've been recruiting a, a lot of uh, both men and, and women uh, for different positions. And generally speaking, I would say that almost always men uh, ask for more uh, payment from the start. Than, than women with equal uh, qualifications do. So uh, meaning that you already start higher, uh, it's difficult to actually close that gap uh, later. That's, that's one thing. The, the other thing I think is um, that women more often tend to end up in, even if they are in, in at the leadership uh, 
management level uh, work, they tend up uh, tend having support functions instead of direct operational functions, uh, which also means that you're paid less. Uh, and then um, I think asking for the pay raise also and negotiating, you know, being brave and uh, sort of bold in, in asking for compensation is maybe more often, uh, it's easier for men to do that. It's again about the self-esteem and the self-confidence. So I think at least those factors. And then, of course, it's not only the, the employers, it's really the, um, also those who employ you who, who uh, maybe have a, well, a bias uh, or chauvinist in, in, in the way that they, they look at uh, the work. That's, of course, also one factor. You want to comment? Chauvinist. What about Estonia? Yeah, yeah, of okay. course. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this is a little bit like alibi for Estonia that uh, in uh, Finland uh, there is almost the same gap. Mm. How it has to be treated, I, I think one way is that the chief must follow the equality in the way that if, if a woman is uh, asking less, you should pay maybe even more, mm. uh, at least compare mm. all, the, all the time, not only what is asked but also also who is uh, getting already uh, on the same level how much and uh, certainly it is a problem but uh, now i'm becoming a little bit toxic but i think there is a still a wide agreement in the society uh, about role division which is not a hundred percent excuse me which is bad but not a hundred percent there is still a, an element of agreement where where missions lie and and uh, and uh, and where men think uh, uh, men uh, uh, feel they should be allowed to be men and women are also appreciating men if they are uh, earning more so there is something which is uh, can't be regulated uh, I, I i would like to tell more <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay, who goes oh. first? Yeah. <laughs> no, you agree okay. between each other. Uh, yes, is it a problem for Estonia? Of course it is. Of course it is. It's not normal that there is a, such a big uh, pay, uh, pay gap and Finland is not excuse. Of course mm. it's a problem. There are many reasons, but I would also have to say that there are some reasons that, that I, I, I personally 100% can't understand. How come? Because if I look historically at Estonia, our women are better educated. I would say that our women are more ambitious than maybe women in some other countries, and still we have the pay gap. So we'll come back, the level of ambitions. We've taken, I would say, one first step when I think it was decided by parliament or government for the, private, for the public sector to make uh, salaries public. So I see that the next step might be or should be the same for private sector. So to see what's really happening. It's always a tricky question. Mm -hmm. And my husband comes from private sector and now he hates me. But I'm going to say that maybe hate you. you hate me already. But, <laughs> but, but maybe that's something to follow the example. And one topic I'd like to bring in is what Minister mentioned, stereotypes. Read at the title. When my, when, I, when my son learned that I'm going to chair the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, he laughed. Because I, I'm not a programmer. I don't know how to repair computers, and I had to start breaking stereotypes that cybersecurity is not about IT geeks. It's about diplomacy, it's about awareness raising, it's about education, it's about digital economy. There are so many other layers, and I'm good in one layer. But we have to break those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So what did I do personally? <laughs> Last spring, when I went to the Munich Cybersecurity Conference, there were 36 speakers and four women. I approached the organizers and asked, how come? And they said that when they were calling women and proposing to speak on the panel, there were mm -hmm. so, many, so many refused. When a man was proposed to speak on the panel, he didn't even ask the heading of the panel. He said <laughs> yes. And after that, he was asking, what's the topic about? So we also have to change our thinking. And we also have to be more active when we have the chance and we have to participate. So since then, I've seen some changes. But let's say in cyber, cyber security, there is a long, long way to go. 
to have more women included into the mm. discussion. And we can say the same stereotypes mm. about many other mm. fields. I don't, I don't think that one day we will have 50-50% of cosmetologists. I don't think it will happen. I don't think that we will have uh, long-haul drivers, 50% men, 50% women, <laughs> but everybody who wants should have the chance and should be encouraged and supported. But the men without qualification would, uh, could have never become a head of a uh, cyber center. Did you want to say I this? hope so. Oh. At least I did my best. <laughs> we don't have dumb men in the, in the, com in the, in the, in the commission. <laughs> okay, Aslundur, your turn. No, I totally agree. And if we look at... Uh, we have got the unadjusted uh, pay gap and then the adjusted pay gap. And I will never understand why... I'm a father of three daughters. Why should my daughters, if they work the same work, same hours, same, uh, same uh, effort, everything, as the next to them, sitting next to them, getting five, eight percent lower salaries? Absolutely. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. That's why we have to use legislation to change this. <laughs> but that is yours to decide. <laughs> as I'm only a guest here. So we agree on the problem. And we agree we don't is... want to have it, but the solution? <laughs> I, I, I think there is some kind of regulation already, but I'm not sure. Regulation <coughs> this is so uh, elementary that uh, I think there is... Not, the question is not in regulation. At least there is a recommendation to make yeah. public the, yeah. the, the salaries. But uh, salaries are public in Finland, I know, and every year there is uh, the day when the salaries are made public uh, for the CEOs well, and board members? individual salaries are not, not public, mm, okay. but salary groups, yes. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, again, uh, transparency, increased transparency, maybe not on individual uh, salaries, but on groups of, of uh, different types of work. Uh, it helps also you as an employer to uh, develop a good image as an employer. So again, through the transparency, you can actually get the positive results, I think, in the long run, because uh, especially in countries like Estonia and Finland, where we will be running out of uh, young people if, if, if we don't either have more immigration or, or, or get more children. Uh, so we need to attract the best people and, and uh, the best young people want to work for good employers that pay equal. I'm absolutely certain of that. So I'm now turning over there, trying to see if there's anybody who would like to ask a question. And you can also ask a question on a topic maybe that we haven't been able to raise yet. Yeah, there's one, one hand. Here. Run, run. Yes, yes, it's here. <laughs> catch it, catch the where, Oh, sorry, where? catch the cube. Where? Where? <gasps> here you are. Thank you. Um, I'm Eva, and I'm a psychologist, mostly specialized on change management. And actually, just when um, listening to Marina's uh, story about how boys and girls uh, conceptualize differently uh, the job and the career perspectives, it came to my mind that perhaps uh, uh, the difference is not that much about uh, the problem itself, but uh, the way girls and boys, or men and women, conceptualize um, the perspectives. I mean, uh, status-oriented, uh, ambitious, uh, versus uh, content-oriented, ambitious. I mean, perhaps uh, the ambitious, or um, uh, yes, uh, the question of being ambitious is pretty much the same, because uh, especially nowadays, I think women and, and girls are quite ambitious. They are not that, they don't have that low self-esteem. But that's uh, pretty much about uh, uh, the question of status that um, men are hunting, I think, more than women. Or what do you think? Well, uh, I, I don't see you. I, I think it's Eva Maria. Yeah? I don't see you. It, we're blinded here. But uh, yes, I've seen that. As I said, I was in foreign service for 26 years, and I've seen young men becoming ambassadors. And they immediately, not all of them, but there are more among them who change their behavior. 
they become ambassadors in their head. Lähevät peast suur saadikuteks. <laughs> and then I see, I've seen women who have become ambassadors. It's difficult for them to become because their requirements for themselves are much higher. They demand of them, again, it's not, uh, uh, it's not 100% generally. They demand from them much more. And once they become ambassadors, they see that they have to work twice as much as they've been working so far. So I would say that in Estonian foreign service, I don't know any woman who has become Piasur Zadik. Um, oh, ambassador, <laughs> no, uh, in your head. Ambassador in your head. So yes, there is the difference. Uh, the content. Well, yes, I'll stop here. I'm not a psychologist. I think you you know it much better. I'm saying uh, I'm saying that's just what I've seen in the foreign service. Anybody else? Question? Yes, yes, coming. Yes, I'm very fast. You went. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Arne Sigurdsson. I'm the ambassador of Iceland to both Finland and, Estone, and Estonia. Uh, uh, in the discussion in Iceland, I think we figured out that uh, without regulations or, or legislation on this issue, uh, particularly with regard to the gender pay gap, we would have to wait until the year, what was it, 2100 or something like that. So I would like to ask, I mean, if you are not into legislation, but you at the same time say that this is a problem, how many years can you afford to wait uh, until you have sort of bridged the gap uh, if you are only using voluntary methods? I don't, I don't know the answer. I'm sure that the, in the audience there are people who are much better aware and if there's somebody, please answer the question. I don't know. What about you, Jürgen? How many years can we afford to wait? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> men are dying out and they are species who, who should like to be protected already. Uh, women are taking uh, over anyway. But it uh, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be uh, pushed too much. Uh, and and uh, I think... Uh, uh, In many cases, if things are if things are in the way we do not uh, like them to be, we we'll see uh, that the, the first answer shouldn't be regulation, and uh, and uh, in, in situation where society is changing already very quickly, you shouldn't uh, rush uh, by regulations. I think it, it's uh, overshooting. I, and, but at the same time, there are regulations. I, I, I certainly, I, I'm sure there are uh, paragraphs where uh, discrimination is forbidden and all, all these salaries are opened in, 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 in uh, public uh, uh, sector already. And, um, um, but I think it has to happen step by step. I, I, I so see so many qualities in, uh, in women which are more suitable for modern life than, than in case of men. I, I really believe it, uh, including uh, leadership. And uh, in leadership, so uh, I really think positions are, uh, of, uh, of my gender are disappearing step by step. It's sad. Without regulation. I don't see that, by the way. Okay, uh, but I, I can see it. So we have. I, see it. Around yeah, me, I, I, I need to it. give you a gift, glasses. Yeah. All right, Gunmar, you want to comment? A, just a comment. I think, again, it's a difference between public and private sector here. In public sector in, in Finland, salaries are quite regulated. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you're a teacher in a, in a high school, that's the salary you get. Uh, but in private sector, I think. Uh, it really is about individual salaries, and uh, uh, and it would be. I, I would personally find it difficult to to put the gender uh, sort of um, staple on 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 the salary uh, because it really should be uh, individual. Uh, on the other hand, uh, again, the reporting uh, that you also have to do as a company is uh, bringing transparency uh, that will show what kind of an employer you are. Uh, which will create discussion amongst your employees. It will also affect how you can recruit. So I think 
again, transparency actually is a very good uh, tool to advance things faster. Thank you. We need to wrap it up now because it's already uh, uh, seven, eight minutes over three o'clock. So, oh, thank you very much. You're very kind. So, do you have anything you want to comment that haven't been uh, said till now? Would you like to summarize, Jürgen? <laughs> how we're going to have like half women in Reform Party for Trans for the next elections? We have only one right now, right? Uh, we, we, are, we, we are the party who, uh, whose leader is a woman. So yeah, but that's only one, right? Uh, one party, yes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the only party whose leader is a woman is, is a reform party. And uh, don't think we are not liberals here. So what was the question? <laughs> Let's leave it that. We can continue. Can I just add yes. one little thing? Uh, because uh, I'm in favor of legislation when it comes to gender equality. For a few years ago, we had a visit to the Parliament of Iceland from a speaker of a parliament that uh, has not a strong, uh, we could say, gender equality. And uh, one of the MPs asks this speaker of the parliament, uh, because we're talking about speeding up process with legislation. One of this uh, Icelandic MP asks him about uh, the position of women in his country and what uh, he's doing to uh, get them more into politics and uh, allow them to vote and etc. etc. And he had a long speech about that Iceland has a 1000 year uh, history as a democracy democratic sit, uh, country. His country only has uh, 100 years history as a democracy. And he's absolutely sure that in 900 years, women in Iceland will have the same position as, as uh, uh, women in his country will have the same position as Iceland. And uh, what we can learn from this is that it doesn't happen by itself. We have to use legislation and it's positive to use, to use it. And this is what I want, wanted to end with by uh, conclude from my speech and everything that you shouldn't be afraid of using legislation, it's good. You shouldn't. Nine, <laughs> 900 years to go, dear Estonians. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, interesting to discuss with you. Thank you.